Um, and our first one comes from an organization called Babies Uganda, um, which is a non-governmental organization that runs schools and orphanages in Uganda. And this organization is sort of playing off what we've seen as, uh, you know, usually this time of year, January, February, March, is a lot of like gym and fitness club advertising, but they're putting a much different spin on it. Um, the campaign comes from Accenture Song. And the effort promotes memberships to something that is called the Soul Gym. And they sort of are upfront about the fact that people will never go to this gym, uh, but the money will still go to a good cause. So let's take a look. Hello, my name is Hakim. Welcome to Soul Gym here in Entebbe, Uganda. This is the weight area. Remember, no pain, no gain. And this is our brand new CrossFit area. This is the cardio area with a thousand miles to go. And if you've liked what you've seen, here comes the best part. The gym is 8,200 kilometers away from your home, so you will never have to come here. Just like your regular gyms at your home, which you don't go to either. The difference is that so gym will make you feel better every day. Because with your monthly membership, you will be sponsoring Babies Uganda, helping hundreds of children to access food and education. Become a member of Soul Gym. The monthly fee for not coming is up to you. All right, so Thomas, why do you like? What do you like about this one? Come on, that puts a smile on your face, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, fundraising is is a difficult discipline. I think we all uh, try to be chased by uh, fundraisers on the street, leaving them underground, etc., and them trying to crack a joke at us. But I think they sort of get three things right. Uh, the first thing, the timing, as you mentioned, EJ, uh, it's January. This uh, ad ad, people are health conscious, looking for health content. So I think there's something around the timing that makes um, makes sense. Secondly, we're talking, uh, we often talked about this idea about uh, preaching to the converted. This time around, they're broadening the target group. I mean, I'm browsing on YouTube and I come across this ad and it pulls me in. So I think it's actually quite clever that they expand the target group for people who might not be in your usual, let me donate to baby uh, Uganda target group. And maybe lastly, and I think it's a point we made so many times before, the tone and style. It's just lighthearted. It's the type of content that you'd uh, come across in between searching how to become healthy in January and uh, the kittens that you might be browsing for on YouTube. Uh, so they, they get a lot of stuff right. It's Yeah, it's definitely an uplifting approach that might sort of be a contract. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our webinar, Crafting Movements for Good. These are the small moments that I really appreciate and look forward to. So I'm so happy that you could uh, tune in here today and uh, joining me. First of all, a big thanks to Andy, who's uh, producing this uh, webinar with us today. She'll keep an eye on all of you and make sure that the tech works. And again, this is a webinar. It's free, it's fun, and it's engaging. So please feel free to use uh, the comment section to ask questions throughout, because else I'll just be talking and talking and talking. Anyway, uh, my name is uh, Thomas, and I'm sure that uh, most of you know, and I come from uh, good advertising. And basically, my purpose, my mission is to uh, be a catalyst for hopefully your positive change. Why do we have a webinar around uh, crafting movements good? You might ask yourself, but it's something that I've been quite passionate about for uh, a while, already back in uh, my first book. Good advertising, I had a chapter around uh, what I at that time called contagiousness. So understanding what uh, campaigns do travel and do spread organically. I can promise you, you know, anybody who will promise you uh, something going viral or organic growth, tune out. It's not trustworthy. And I can't really promise you any of that stuff. But I can hopefully hint at some of the stuff I learned along the way. And in my latest book, I follow up some of my fascination around sort of crafting movements for good in the book, uh, The Hero Trap. Uh, and, and what we did there with the research team was we analyzed more than a couple of hundred campaigns. And we started to see an exciting pattern. 
And I'm going to share today eight of those hacks with you. Uh, so I'm quite excited about it. And uh, keep your eyes and ears uh, peeled to the screen. We're going to see a lot of campaigns. and We're going to discuss uh, these eight hacks and hopefully also um, yeah, what happens if you apply them? Do you recognize other campaigns that live up to one or several of these hacks? So anyways, it's going to be a fun little energy-filled uh, webinar we're having here today. Again, remember, any questions, do ask them, and we can do a little pause and we can have a look at them. So time for a little... Um, um, show here um uh, perfect so crafting moments for good Ta -da. anyways i thought let's kick it off with a little talk about a film that kind of goes a couple of years ago all the way back uh to colombian and it's a film focusing on something that is becoming more and more uh prominent and a bigger bigger issue these days which is invasive species in this uh, case it is a lion fish this little beauty or beast that we're seeing portraying here but i, I want to kick it off with just watching this little video to sort of give you a little bit of an idea about what i mean by sort of platforms and crafting platform for change so let's uh, roll this uh, little film Mi abuelo fue pescador, mi papá también es pescador, yo soy pescador y espero que mis hijos sean pescadores. Uno aquí vive con 15 barras de la pesca, pero si no coge uno nada, se va sin nada. El animal es venenoso al contacto humano, pero una vez cazado es delicioso. La pesca del pez eh, no es fácil, requiere una técnica, eh, requiere un tiempo y eso obviamente es un proceso en el que estamos construyendo esa cultura, no solo de consumo, sino de cómo generamos la posibilidad que esos pescadores desarrollen su actividad. Ay, yo, creí, yo pensaba que era más difícil, Muy, es práctico y sí, se puede, se puede utilizar. Yo no solo quiero ser un pescador, también quiero ser un cazador de peleón. Beautiful. So we got a little introduction to Jose, uh, the future lionfish hunter. But why I wanted to begin with this uh, example is think about it. If that brief had landed on your table, most likely what would have happened was that you had created an awareness campaign. What is so beautiful about this is you basically empower people. You put the tools in their hands to create the change, to amplify the change. This is about their um, way of living. This is about feeding their families. So obviously they have an interest in helping this campaign pick up speed. So we're going to talk a lot about how a lot of these campaigns are life-centric. Another thing I really want to make clear today, because we are in quite a different uh, marketing universe today in the sense that we, uh, and I know that uh, we got a very, very uh, diverse audience here today from nonprofit side, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at traditional advertising, it's very much a sort of control and command way of 
going about campaigns, talking about target groups, talking about campaigning, sort of like a very warlike language. But the realization I have had over the 20 or years I've been in the industry is we don't hold any power. This guy does. Everyone out there who are uploading the baby photos, who are doing the little selfies, etc. Today, people are the biggest media producers. And so we need to give people something to play with, not just serve some pre-made dish that doesn't really spark their imagination or engage them in any sort of way. So typically, I always look at this very, very simple little circle here. And I say, when you do communication, make sure that you leave this little piece of the circle open for people to finish, to feel empowered, to feel part of the campaign, that they have a say, something to contribute with. So it's that little thing that make your gray brain cells open up, engage. Uh, and I love those types of campaigns. Secondly, I think it is abundantly clear that the today's biggest campaigns aren't made from the traditional advertising agencies. It's things like the school strike for climate. He obviously represented by Greta Thunberg. Um, it's things like the Me Too movement, where women and men for that sake all across the world have taken this loose concept of Me Too and interpreted that and built on that and created one of the most powerful uh, movements of the last decade. And yet, even if we look at how we, you know, use products and services, <laughs> even something as simple as Ikea, people are starting to hack. Uh, after years of probably fighting that, Ikea is finally embracing that movement. So I think one of the things we learned during COVID was obviously that the best things in life aren't things. We are creative human beings. We like creating stuff. And so how can you use that to fuel your campaigns, to make it contagious, to make it spread, spread faster? And obviously, platforms like Etsy showcase that. If we look at Airbnb, quite an interesting one right because suddenly we are the hotel we are the ones who are responsible for guest service guest communication even in some aspects marketing our little place so in that way everything has sort of changed i gotta say that i have two beautiful nieces and looking at what they do on instagram and how uh, uh, where they are, they are probably a better social media manager than most uh, CMOs out there when 10, 15 years. Um, and so even today, something even as guns are now in the public hands with 3D printing. So everything you can make, people can most likely make better and more interesting. And when we realize that, we can turn that into an effective vehicle in our campaign. So we got to look at a lot of campaigns today at some businesses who have done that really well and, uh, and have some fun. Again, remember, any questions, do uh, remember to ask those. and We will come back to those probably sort of midway and uh, we can do a little stuff there. Also, this fundamentally changes businesses. I know that I have, and for some of you who have uh, read the book, The Hero Trap might have uh, read about Marie de la Croix. Marie de la Croix was very fascinated about Starbucks. She wanted to work in Starbucks. She didn't get the job. Her hair color was green. Didn't really live up to the Starbucks guidelines, apparently, of dress code. But what she did was she created a business that fundamentally empowered everyone. So it was these beautiful relays cafes the first one she put and opened up just in front of a starbucks just to kind of provoke starbucks a little bit the business model is obviously fundamentally different it's a micro franchise so most of us don't have half a million us dollars lying around but we might have about five thousand us dollars and so then we can start our own little micro franchise coffee bike and then that way uh marie de la croix did not only just create a campaign, but a platform for an amazing uh, business that is one of the fastest growing in the coffee uh, space uh, today. Unfortunately, not anymore. They're not around anymore, but it's a really, really exciting business case uh, to look at. 
So I talk about how the fundamental power shift is happening from where companies use to do everything we promote, we advertise, all that stuff, to a new market reality where you are in charge. Um, so uh, I often talk about and have this little um, wheel in uh, my book, The Hero Trap, and you can also scan the QR code there for more information about it. Um, but but basically what it does, it looks at pricing, uh, placement, product, and uh, promotions or campaigning. We've got to talk about the campaigning part today where you move from company, company being in control of everything, starting to engage people, opening up for co-creation, and finally actually handing over the campaign to people, as we saw in the example with the um, lion fish campaign where the fishermen themselves had a lot of stake and obviously were very interested in taking that campaign and spreading that one further. Um, for those of you who have followed me for a while, you probably won't uh, have missed uh, my uh, views on how to craft uh, meaningful brands. Uh, I think brands today should help us transform, uh, be better people. So not be preachers, but coaches, because in a world that are full with purposeful brands and brands who want to play a role in our lives, I fundamentally believe that people are no longer buying uh, why you do what you do, your values, but who you can help them become. Because when you help people on their journey, uh, helping them maybe with their dreams, aspirations, or overcome challenges i think this is where you can feel that a brand or a leader or an organization have done a difference in your life because i can feel that this company have made me live healthier or made me face some of my own biases so the first thing we want to do when we start looking at these eight hacks and i'll come to these eight hacks just now is look at your own life look at people's lives the ones who you want to touch and fundamentally you can bring that what makes a good life into a number of categories in this example is 12 categories everything from having money to having a lovely family around you to maybe having a girlfriend or boyfriend to having a work that's full of purpose so all these things can be your building platform of where you can engage people let me get let me begin with uh, our first little example here today and, and some of you might have uh, come across this campaign for a while I don't know how you are, but when I travel, if I go to big cities, uh, Lagos in Nigeria, or I go to uh, New York, I always love to go into a park to just get a bit of breathing space. Uh, and I think this uh, was one of the things that um, that uh, II, which is a brand of um, outdoor gear, really realized. So they launched this campaign called Opt outside targeting people who loved <coughs> nature sorry about that on the bestest shopping day of the year in the u.s black friday uh, so they said to people don't <laughs> don't go and shop go out and enjoy nature and that way they empowered people to go out and i'm going to share some of those results with you as well another example that i'm sure that uh, most of uh, you definitely know is from uh, an old campaign called the ice bucket uh, challenge which was uh, an amazing campaign that uh, uh, raised uh, an unprecedented amount of uh, money uh, for the cause essentially by making it playful and engaging that people sort of had to pour an ice bucket um, over themselves so kind of like a little bold challenge to all of you out there so let's just watch uh, a short um, example of how uh, that campaign inspired uh, celebrities and business tycons like uh, Bill Gates. So let's roll the. And after I dump this bucket of ice on my head, I get to nominate three new people to challenge. So I'm going to challenge Bill Gates, my partner at Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg, and Netflix's founder and CEO, Reed Hastings. I'm glad to give to ALS. It's a great cause, but I, I want to accept this challenge. I want to do it better than it's been done. Been working on this, you know, got this design. There we go. Yeah. It's going to be great. Mm. 
I'm here to join the people bringing attention to Lou Gehrig's disease by taking the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. I'm going to challenge three more people, Elon Musk, Ryan Seacrest, and Chris Anderson of TED. Consider yourself challenged. You have 24 hours. Good luck. <laughs> uh, probably for uh, a lot of you, uh, are a nice uh, opportunity to sort of rewatch uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge. I'm sure that you have seen some of these uh, videos uh, floating around uh, the internet. And uh, for those of you who are a bit younger, sorry for bringing an old uh, reference here. But remember that little circle I talked about? So obviously opening up for people uh, to play and engage uh, with the campaign. So what I realized uh, was that in terms of crafting these movement, in terms of creating campaigns that spread, there were eight sort of metrics that, uh, or hacks, I would call them, or guidelines that sort of went uh, through uh, all of them. Uh, some campaigns would have all eight, uh, others would have a number of them. Uh, obviously, I would claim that the more you get right, the higher chance you have of obviously creating something that is movement building. Uh, so we'll go through all of these eight, and I hope that you uh, do recognize these. And uh, if you have examples of some of this stuff along the way, um, then um, do share that as well. And uh, good uh, to see you, uh, Marina, um, all the way from Buenos Aires. Uh, uh, thanks for joining today. So uh, let's begin with uh, our first uh, little um, goal here. Um, and um, we're going to talk more about up that side as an example of uh, how this can be done. So uh, first up, it is about setting a clear and shared transformative goal. For opt outside, that was on a the big shopping day, obviously, get people to recognize uh, that being out in nature, it's great. It's fun. It's, you know, uh, promoting like well-being. Um, and so they speak to something that all of us are longing towards. So identifying that clear, transformative goal. Again, see with the Colombian fishermen. This was about livelihood. As I said, finances could be one of those things that you might want to dive into. So that's the first thing you want to figure out. And I tend to spend quite a lot of time getting this right. The second one is motivational. Aim for action. Do something. Make a rallying cry. What are you asking people to do? Sometimes it might be one thing. Sometimes it might be more things. And sometimes it might actually be open for people to interpret this. Uh, for opt outside, uh, it was a pretty open brief. Go out there, enjoy the outdoors. And there's a lot of different suggestions from people all around the US in terms of how they actually did that. Third, back to that little circle I said, make it open for people's uh, creativity. What can they do? Don't give them all the building blocks right away. You know, people want to have fun. I mean, uh, we're creative human beings. Acknowledge that. You know, the internet is so much full of people's uh, creations, people having fun. And so if you want to have any uh, chance of creating powerful movements, this is definitely what you want to nail the most. Uh, good to see uh, Ingrid Mitchell uh, there as well uh, joining us. Uh, so uh, great to see you, Ingrid. And again, all of you, uh, you're more than welcome also to comment on uh, some of these things and introduce yourself. The fourth goal is quite an important one. How do you make it replicable? How do you create for recreation? How can you create something that is very, very easy for people to do? I realized quite early on that these platforms uh, were quite often created like a game. So in a game, there are uh, certain rules, there are certain ways that the players need to behave, 
and you can keep playing that game again and again and again. The amazing thing about Up That Side was from the first year when it started in 2015, today it's much, much older, but this is some research that is back uh, to the Hero Trap when uh, we did that research, was in fact that more than 700 organizations joined and more than 15 million people participated. So from being um, a day where people would, uh, you know, hurry to the shops and buy more stuff, it opened the Americans' eyes to uh, the natural wonders, the national parks. And it was so interesting, the one thing I asked uh, my research team to do at the time was to uh, check in with some of those national parks in the U.S. And uh, it actually showed out that from a day that saw barely no visitors in those state parks, today it's one of the most visited days. So when you get this right, you build movements and you build change. The fifth one, uh, I think it's an important one, is how do you make it open for everyone uh, to take part and make it as easy, whether it's organizations who can join, businesses who can join, or just ordinary folks. Think about how you can make it common and open for everyone. That makes it spread much faster. And make it, make it accessible. Um, obviously, if you think about the ice bucket challenge and ALS, I mean, you need a bucket, you need some ice water. And I've seen even more creative <laughs> attempts of still living up to sort of those guidelines. But think about how you can make it as, as accessible for people as possible. Don't demand too much. Don't make it too tricky. Don't make it too difficult because else people won't do it. You have to think about how you make it easy. And make it relevant. Make it relevant for your brand. REI is a company that sells gear to people who love the outdoors. It's a great fit for an opt outside campaign. I actually admittedly quite often see this failing for especially brands going into this space who might embrace ocean plastics or other things that aren't really a clear uh fit for that brand so make sure that you also uh live up to that so those are sort of the eight guidelines um and let's just go quickly back there and just put them up there again so we talk about transformative guided motivational creative replicable common accessible and lastly relevant and I'm going to show you a couple of more examples of uh, brands, organizations, businesses who got rid this right. Because remember, in the very beginning, I showed you this sort of wheel where you had to move out from a we control everything mindset to empowering people. It's called a wheel because the further out on the wheel, the more you can sort of steer and control the direction of your campaigns, of your marketing efforts. But I really want to show you uh, a campaign that has had tremendous success and who also lives up to these eight principles. So let's have a look at American Express's uh, campaign called Small Business Saturday. When it comes to the holiday shopping season, there's a day for the big boys, Black Friday, and one dedicated to internet merchants, Cyber Monday. But what about the small, independently owned local businesses, the ones that create jobs and invigorate neighborhoods? Shouldn't they have their own day? American Express Open thought so, and they created a day just for the little guy, Small Business Saturday. The hub of this new movement was Facebook. Small business owners could find the tools to promote the day and customers could declare their support. Set for November 27, 2010, Small Business Saturday launched with a rallying cry of Shop Small. Let's support the small business owners getting our economy booming with the first ever Small Business Saturday. On November 27th, shop small. It's going to be huge. Huge turned out to be an understatement. Mayors from New York City to Topeka to San Francisco officially proclaimed November 27th Small Business Saturday. They were joined by the governors of Kentucky, New Jersey, Oregon, and Utah to name a few. 
and American Express put their money where their logo was, offering shoppers who used their Amex card at independently owned small businesses a $25 credit when they spent $25, and almost 250,000 people signed up to take advantage. A day to shop small took on a life of its own. Over 2,500 articles appeared everywhere, from the local news to the Wall Street Journal. In its third week, Small Business Saturday was the fastest growing page on Facebook, and over 1.2 million people had joined the community. Most importantly, all that awareness turned into action. In a year when holiday sales increased less than 4%, that weekend saw overall sales up 9 and small retailers saw sales jump 28% from customers using their American Express cards. In the end, Open had created a brand new day in the holiday shopping season and the heart of the American shopper. See you next year. What is so fascinating about this campaign is that not only did it uh, uh, tap into a sentiment that I think more and more people today feel with uh, uh, big malls with uh, big brands and high streets, you know, they see their small local corner stores disappearing. So they're tapping into this little mindset that obviously both speak to us as consumers and citizens, but obviously also to the small uh, business owners and lots of other organizations. So in fact, they can join a lot of people and make it common and accessible uh, for everyone. What's so fascinating to see as well is that it's still running uh, in the US, uh, still generating uh, billions of US dollars uh, in revenue for these small businesses. And a couple of years ago, it was um, imported uh, to the UK, where it seemed a, a similar sort of uh, upwards uh, trajectory, uh, leaving lots of pounds in the local hands of um, uh, British small businesses. Uh, the next little um, film I'm going to show you, and I want to, uh, I want you to keep your sort of eyes and uh, ears open on this one, because I want you to sort of see if you can identify eight hacks, six hacks, five hacks, whatever it might be. So does this campaign live up to what I spoke about? And we're going to talk about bicycles and a brand that unfortunately just recently um, went bankrupt, which I'm very, very sorry about. It's a, a brand called Hilding, and what they do is they do these. It's basically uh, an inflatable bicycle helmet. So you wear the scarf, and if you uh, are falling off your bicycle, the scarf will uh, sort of... Uh, turn itself into a helmet and protect you. So holding this this campaign in the UK. Uh, so let's have a look at this next campaign and keep an eye on those eight hacks and see if the campaign lives up to them. My name is Merlin, I'm 11 years old and I love biking. At the moment I am practicing cycling to school alone. I feel safe in my neighbourhood, but I would never go to central London with my bike. In the last sort of five years they've seen the, the number of cyclists probably triple. And a lot of those are inexperienced cyclists who are not aware of the dangers of going down the sides of lorries or down the sides of buses or opening doors and things like that. You just don't know where they're going to come. They come behind you, they whiz across you. If I look at it, that, you know, it makes me nervous. I believe people should just travel and be aware. If there is something wrong or they find something unsafe, write to a local council, do your thing, because it's the world we created ourselves. People do have to give a beat because we cannot continue the way we are. We have massive obesity problems in this country, diabetes, pollution, congestion, all those things through inactivity. And cycling is joyous. It's absolutely freedom. The Give a Beep initiative helps people to channel their frustration as well as bringing us together. It's important that all of us who cycle or wish to be able to cycle work together in order to turn this situation around. United as a strong force, we can encourage the mayor to act faster in transforming London into the cycle-friendly city we deserve. OK, this is a flick. I'm supposed to press this when I feel scared or frustrated. That's when I give a beep.
When I give a beat, a message will be sent to the man. Because he needs to start giving a beat too. Great. So I'm very curious uh, how you all feel about this campaign and, and whether you could see those eight hacks uh, apply. Uh, generally a very applaudable campaign. I think there's uh, way too little conversation today about uh, other means of transportation in cities. Uh, why we're always talking about EVs, etc. We should be walking, we should be bicycling, we should be supporting uh, public transportation. So anyone who uh, saw, um, you know, did it live up to it? Uh, was there any flaws that you noticed? I'm just going to give you uh, a little while to answer that, and then I'm going to comment back on that. Okay. I can put up the eight guidelines just as a uh, little um, chance for you to remember them. Great. Um, so overall, and, and this I think is an important point, overall um, Give a Beep does live up to quite a few of these. I mean, it's definitely transformative. We know what the goal is. It's a goal that I think a lot of us can recognize. And obviously the story is being told very nicely there by a little kid who feels unsafe in the streets of London. Um, are there guidelines and directions? Um, yes. There are. Um, we know what we need to do. Uh, is there a cry for action? Yes. Uh, is it open for creation? Maybe not that much, in fact, if you think about it. It's all very sort of centered around this one tech gadget. Is it replicable? Not so much either. Can everyone participate? Not really, unless you've got that little yellow checky thingy. Is it accessible? Again, more difficult. In terms of relevancy, yes, the brand does have a relevant role to play. So this does show that you really sort of need to think very thoroughly about these uh, eight hacks if you want to get everything right. And even though you might get very captivated when you see a campaign like that, and I really love the initiative, I think they really figured out and a very important sort of transformative um, goal and there's a real motivation behind it, etc. They just lag on some of those other principles. So it's very, very important that you think these things true. Um, so I don't know if you out there in the community and the audience today can think of any similar platforms, uh, any similar campaigns that you think have some of, some of these elements or have a sort of movement building aim uh, to them. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious to uh, to hear that and you're more than welcome to share that uh, in the comments as well. Uh, and, and while you do that, I'll get back to one of the questions that uh, Ingrid uh, did ask. So uh, thanks for asking Ingrid. Uh, I'm curious what is required to scale beyond the brand sphere of control. What I mean here is do you see brands reach out to collaborate with other brands to create more systemic change? Very much so. I, I think that especially when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to impact, we do see multiple brands uh, collaborate around uh, certain courses, around certain issues. I mean, one of the, the early platforms I covered all the way back in my first book um, was Project Red uh, by uh, Bobby Shriver, and that was supported. Uh, by multiple brands, Apple, Nike, et cetera. And this was to uh, raise uh, funds uh, for um, the diseases. Uh, and uh, what the brands uh, used to do, uh, the only thing they could or should do was actually just use the color red. So Apple launched uh, 
red uh, iPod, Nike did some red shoelaces, etc. So there are uh, a number of examples of that, and I'll, I'll share some uh, some more for you uh, uh, in a while, uh, Ingrid, so you can um, you can have a look at that as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, these days, you know, with the whole, uh, what is called open bar behind or whatever, I mean, if we take our really cynical marketing glasses on, obviously Barbie has been an example of using pink, very easy as Project Red I just talked about, to do lots of brand collaborations. This was obviously to bring a lot of attention around the film uh, Barbie, but again, it is a way of building movements and making it easy for people to participate, for people to throw their own little pink parties and what else we've seen out there. So people became extremely creative and it was very, very easy. Uh, and those are exactly the things that you need to do. And so Ingrid's points about uh, collaborations, uh, I don't know how many of you are um, aware of Palais for the Ocean, who is a nonprofit organization uh, who works uh, to combat um, uh, pollution of our oceans with uh, ocean plastics. And one of the big collaborations they have done uh, over the years is with uh, Adidas, uh, where they uh, launched sneakers made out of ocean plastics. And in this case, they even uh, launched a, a tennis tournament uh, on the grid. Uh, barrier reef to draw more attention to uh, the rising problem of ocean plastics. Uh, the amazing thing is that the Palais for um, Oceans Adidas uh, collaboration sneakers have uh, sold hundreds, uh, um, hundreds of millions of uh, euros generated for Adidas and for that uh, course, so a very, very highly effective way of uh, doing that. Um, obviously, again, doesn't in the same way live up to as many of these sort of eight hacks uh, as I shared. So again, think about how you can apply most of them or all of them. Another campaign I want to mention um, was a campaign I judged a couple of years ago uh, when I was in the jury of the Can Lions Sustainable Development Goal uh, judging. So this uh, this is a big award show uh, in the advertising industry trying to put focus on campaigns uh, doing great work in uh, and within the Sustainable Development Goals. And one of the campaigns I really liked there was this project called the Open Door Project, um, taking place in India. And basically uh, what it did was encourage private schools that when they close and the pupils leave, the schools are just there uh, in the late afternoon, in the evenings. And they encouraged the communities to open those up for some of those people who are not as lucky. So, um, uh, so that could see people in the more impoverished communities come to the school, utilize the school, encouraging teachers and professionals to come and help educate and raise the next generation of uh, Indians. And I absolutely love that because I do think education is a massive driver of change and inequality. Um, it's an amazing initiative, and um, I haven't actually checked in with this project for a while, but obviously, as you can see there, in terms of the impact, more than 55 schools already uh, joined at that point. So it was uh, easy for the schools to take part. It didn't really demand that uh, necessarily many resources. So a beautiful little uh, project uh, from the world of uh, nonprofits that I uh, really, really loved. But you can also think about this further in terms of being more uh, generous around uh, your brand and your activities. Uh, so again, moving from a we create the product type mindset to a we engage type mindset or to a co-creation mindset. And that was exactly what IKEA did with this next uh, project uh, with this fun little fella. So IKEA said, hey, wait a moment. There are actually one out of 10 people on planet Earth, according to the WHO, that lives with some sort of disability. Why aren't we doing anything for them? So IKEA thought, 
let's launch a project called Disability. So let's have a look at this little video. Hi, I'm Eldel, 32 years old. Although I have cerebral palsy, I do everything I can to conduct myself like everyone else. But in my own home, of all places, I'm surrounded with furniture crying out, cripple. I'd like to sit on a regular sofa without being afraid I won't be able to get up, to open regular closet, or even to turn on a regular lamp. One in every 10 people in Israel is a disabled person. The IKEA design vision gave birth to the Disables Project. Smart hacks making IKEA's best-selling items accessible. The project was created in collaboration with two NGOs, Milbot and Access Israel, and started off in the IKEA store with a hackathon of product engineers and disabled people that enabled better understanding of their needs. In the end of the developing process, 13 new products were born, each solving a different accessibility issue, such as sofa elevating legs for easier ascending, lamp button enlargement, special handles for PAX closets, and more. The new products are presented in the world's first accessible living spaces in the IKEA stores. The new models are available for download from the project's website, disables.com, and 3D printing anywhere in the world. So that Eldar, Dina, Pavel, Inbal, Moshe, Tahel, and Miguel can also feel comfortable in their own homes like everybody else. Now they should come up. And good old I said now IKEA should just come up with products that assemble themselves. Uh, so good, 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 a helpful, friendly, funny advice there from Elder. Um, so one of the sheets that we use uh, when we work with uh, nonprofits or brands is this uh, wheel that I showed uh, all of you earlier that actually looks at the whole uh, marketing mix. Uh, today, uh, I primarily focused on the campaign side uh, with these eight hacks, these platforms. Uh, you can learn much more about this uh, sheet by uh, scanning uh, the QR code. And and it's, it's a really sort of helpful reminder to understand how much to actually open up for people's co-creation and imagination. Because quite often, the reason why people don't engage is that you don't open up for their engagement. So you need to remember to open that little circle. And it's so incredible to see when you do that. And, and let me just give you uh, an example again from uh, the world of nonprofits. Um, the Movember movement, uh, I'm sure that uh, you have heard about this campaign where men doing November uh, flashes uh moustache uh i kind of almost have one here uh to bring focus to um in the beginning it was focused on testicular cancer today it's focused on men's health in general it started as a little jest between some friends in australia and ended up becoming one of the fastest growing uh non-profits uh in the world by really taking these uh, fundamental principles uh, at heart and the co-founder Adam, uh, I think uh, his quote really speaks truth to what I'm trying to uh, spoon feed you here right now is that let's please give people a big opportunity to have fun, to play, to engage, to be creative with the campaign's activities. Then and only then, I think we can sort of bridge the engagement crisis that we see with a lot of digital content out there. Yes, you can pay your way to eyeballs, but you can't pay your way to people actually engaging and willingly engaging and recreating uh, your campaign. So uh, that uh, brings me obviously. Uh, to just giving you an example of uh, a brand who has gotten sort of more of this transformative mindset right and who really understands how to empower both their small and big customers. I, you know, growing up in Denmark, <laughs> big fan of uh, Lego. And uh, one of the people I did interview uh, for my book, The Hero Trap, was uh, David. And obviously he says that, you know, the Lego brick, and what it does to people, yeah, for sure, it's going to be relevant as long as all of us got hands, as some of us 
got hands. And I think they really have across activities, across movies, etc., cetera, inspired all of us to take part in their work. And even this little endeavor that I was quite uh, bummed about didn't exist when I was a kid. Uh, legal Ideas is basically a platform where um, big and small Lego fans out there, big and small creators can upload their Lego model. And if it gets more than 10,000 supporters, that will actually turn into a real Lego collection. As a kid, that would have been a dream come true for me. So brands who get this right, brands who understand that this is not about the militaristic target and campaign and calling people consumers and target groups. That's the wrong approach. Really need to look at people as whole, whole human beings with dreams and aspirations and a real want to take part in all of this. So that's what I wanted to share with you uh, here today. And uh, we will also uh, leave some time for uh, questions and also encourage you uh, to join uh, our next upcoming webinar. Again, they're free. Um, my purpose is to be a catalyst for your positive uh, change, but I really want to encourage you to share this with uh, colleagues and friends and others who you think can benefit from this. Uh, in this next webinar, I'm going to talk about uh, sustainability as a marketing uh, superpower. I think uh, in these days, we do see more and more people shying away from communicating their um, sustainability efforts, which is sad because we really need urgent momentum, urgent change right now. So it's on the 23rd of April and it will be announced on the website and uh, through social. So uh, I really encourage you uh, to sign up there as well. So this was a quick tour de force of uh, the eight hacks that uh, can help you on this little journey. I do hope that you, when you uh, are thinking about crafting your movements, uh, will have these eight hacks in mind. And also, again, have a look at the wheel. It's a really great way of taking your organization, whether you're in the nonprofit space or whether you are a big brand or even a government um, institution. This is a real great way of. Uh, anchoring and uh, opening up for people's uh, creativity and for people's willingness to take part. Um, um, and uh, th thank you uh, to all of you for joining here today, but uh, we will leave uh, some minutes more uh, for uh, any questions. And while we are uh, waiting, uh, for these questions, you know, have a think. Um, as I said, uh, my fascination with movements actually started all the way back uh, with my uh, first book, uh, Good Advertising, in the chapter about contagiousness. Um, and, and even there, you will be able to find uh, lots of other examples. Obviously, the framework wasn't as developed uh, back then. This goes back a lot of the research all the way back to 2009. But you will still be able to um, find some really good examples. Um, you know, uh, one of these are uh, still my uh, one of my my favorites, um, where celebrities uh, pull the plug on uh, their social media uh, to bring focus and raise uh, funds for uh, the nonprofit uh, Keep a Child uh, Alive, a campaign that really. Uh, put itself on uh, the digital radar out there. Uh, so we have a question from uh, uh, Henry. Uh, so thank you, Henry, and thank you for joining. How can a micro company implement these principles and campaigns? As usually, there's not a massive follow base in social media. How to get attention? Uh, Henry, this is actually a, a very sort of powerful uh, tool for change for small uh, and medium-sized businesses that doesn't have uh, the marketing budgets or the media budgets of big brands. Uh, because the whole idea is that you turn your uh, customers, your fans, everyone into the ones who are actually promoting what you are doing. Uh, I can give you a, a, a small example. Um, from a um, 
uh, from a guy called uh, Dave Hackens who uh, created uh, this project called Precious Plastics. Uh, basically what Dave, a designer and environmentalist, uh, wanted to do was to empower all of us to understand that if we take ocean plastics, we can turn that into things. So not necessarily just looking at the product, but actually shining a light on the amazing possibilities. And it's an amazing movement. Look at our precious plastics. There's no marketing budget. There's no media budget. But he's relying on people who had enough about the state of our oceans. And it's so great to see the projects and the creativity that's popping up uh, everywhere uh, across uh, the world. Uh, and even in, in Slovenia recently, uh, some of those uh, designers who uh, took some of those granulated plastics and turned them into some beautiful uh, design objects uh, got awarded um, uh, by the uh, Slovenian government. So uh, it's really interesting to see how that is uh, doable. So uh, I can see we have uh, some other questions. Uh, so let's um, continue with those. Uh, we have a question from uh, Aline. So thank you, Aline, for uh, tuning in today. Um, and Aline asks, wondering why major brands do not use this strategy more often. Is there a barrier or challenge refraining uh, them? It's a good question. Uh, I'm sure that there are uh, some big uh, brands, CMOs, uh, online today here as well, so they can uh, answer that question. I think giving up the control of your marketing in that way uh, uh, can be stressful. It can be kind of like when you as a parent uh, needs to get your or your teenager leaving home and you know all the concerns and nervousness that is around that period in your life. And I think a lot of marketeers aren't used to this type of mindset because you know even when I grew up in the world of advertising, it was this sort of command and control. Uh, media space, it was uh, television, radio, outdoor print advertising. So it demands a fundamentally different mindset to understand that uh, we as professional communicators aren't the biggest ones ever more and anymore, but it is actually you and I, um, I are there that really dominates the media space. So it, it, it demands uh, a shift. And that's also why I said the, the wheel uh, for me is a good way of uh, opening up that conversation for brands to understand what can essentially happen when you embrace this new type of mindset and you start viewing yourself as a transformative organization and you open up your campaigns for people's uh, creativity. So we have uh, time for one uh, last uh, question from uh, uh, Mitchell. Uh, so let's uh, bring that one up there. So uh, curious how my companies sustain the platform they create over time. A campaign approach is more often short term, fueled by short term planning timelines. I hope this question makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And it's a very, very good question. Yes, you are right that often you have campaign cycles that are shorter. I've always encouraged people who work with impact purpose to understand that this is not a short-term marketing effort. This is something you need to invest in or time uh, to reap the benefits. Typically, it takes uh, more time for people to get used to uh, sort of work in this space. Some of the campaigns I've uh, seen uh, and shared with you today, such as Opt Outside, Small Business Saturday, uh, Movember Movement and others, uh, have turn into long-term efforts. But let's be honest. I mean, probably if they hadn't been successful the first year, they probably wouldn't have continued. And I could give you an example of that, even though I think they would have benefited from investing and reinvesting in the campaign. But uh, back in 2010, uh, Pepsi, who has been uh, a big sponsor of uh, the Super Bowl, a, a football tournament in the US, one of the uh, most um, expensive uh, advertising breaks in the world, uh, went away from sponsoring Super Bowl to creating a project called Project Refresh, where they asked Americans to go out and support uh, community projects. And this was a campaign they ran for one year, and then they pulled the plug. I think if they'd kept going and investing in that project, it might also have uh, delivered those business results. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. We have uh, hit the 60 minutes mark. Uh, it was such a pleasure uh, joining you again. I, I really do enjoy these um, free webinars and as a way of engaging 
with the community. I really do hope that you want to share uh, feedback, share on social, etc. And I really do hope uh, also uh, for you to join next time if it's a topic uh, that interests you, uh, sustainability as a marketing superpower. Now it's all in your hands. Go out there, create some movements for change. It's never been more uh, needed as we see wildfires in Mexico, in, in uh, sorry, in Texas. We have a water crisis in uh, Mexico City, and there's so many things right now that really demands all of us uh, to come together. So thank you so much, and thank you so much for joining this webinar.